Hello, my name is Bradley Alicia. I'm from the Orthogonal Research and Education Lab in the Open Room Foundation. Uh, there's my URL at the bottom of the screen. And today I'm here to talk to you about dynamical representations of heterochrony in the developmental process. And this is something that's been uh, presented at a number of Dynamics Days conferences, including Dynamics Days 2019 and Dynamics Days Digital 2020. So I'm going to start this with a question, and that is, how does a developmental phenotype grow and change shape from a spherical egg to a complex organism? And you can see in this example that we are using the uh, C. elegans model organism to uh, look at this problem. We have a very early stage egg, and it transforms into this adult phenotype. So in this case, in many other cases, it boils down to changes in the timing of growth. And that's something we call heterochrony, and that's been extensively studied. But in this presentation, we're going to talk about how to put some mathematical flesh on the bones of the idea. So to demonstrate this, we're going to start with three different graphs, bivariate graphs. And we ask the question, given the same length of development, one of the following three conditions may hold. Uh, so the first case is the one on the left, which is that growth starts at the same time but slows or speeds up. So this blue function is the sort of control function. This is the original growth rate. It starts here and it ends up here. If we take, uh, if we change the growth rate so that it's slower, we end up with this red function. So it starts at the same time, but it grows more slowly. And so the end of the function is exhibits less growth. So this y-axis represents some facet of growth. And this uh, x-axis represents developmental time. So if we go up to the upper right, we ask if growth starts later and proceeds at the same speed, what does that look like? And so again, we have this blue function that is the same as here. It's the original function. And what we can do is take this blue function, uh, start growth, the growth process later in time, and then proceed at the same rate. And when we do that, we end up with less growth because we run out of time to grow any longer. And so we can go down to the upper right-hand corner of this graph and look at a different scenario. In this case, the growth starts later, but it speeds to, it speeds up so that it, it catches up with the original function. So in this blue function, we can uh, start growth later, so we can delay the growth, onset of growth, but then growth is faster and it speeds up and catches this blue function uh, with the offset of growth. And so why is this important? Well, it describes how long different parts of the body can grow, and uh, that describes a lot of the aspects of growth and form and shape. And so how do we provide a quantitative description of this process? There exists a quantitative description already, but it's largely based on that bivariate type of analysis linear using linear functions, and that's the description. Uh, but can we use a higher level of quantitative description for this? Uh, and in doing so, can we discover whether this, this heterochronic change involves a simple changes in timing, or are there other underlying mechanisms to this? Um, now, we know from biology that this bivariate relationship has, is very complex. Uh, for example, changes in timing in development, we know are controlled by something called heterochrony genes, which are genes that are expressed that change the timing, the onset and offset of growth. Uh, which provide an input to developmental modules, which are parts of the phenotype that evolve or develop at different rates. So when you get new tissues forming, uh, those new tissues uh, uh, change differentially or grow differentially, those can be devel different developmental modules, which tune the parameters to phenotypic modules, which are the adult versions of developmental modules, but they're explicitly tied to the adult phenotype. And all this stuff acts to shape differential growth and shape in the phenotype. So differential growth and shape occur from gene expression of heterochrony genes. They provide an input to developmental modules, which are differentially growing in development and shaping. And then the phenotypic, this results in phenotypic modules, which we observe in the adult phenotype, the developmental modules being the inputs to those over time. And this all acts to shape this differential growth. 
And so we can go through a couple hypotheses here to sort of get a sense of what's going on. And we can use some mathematical uh, representations to describe these different hypotheses of heterochrony. I don't want to call them components because we want to be open-minded. So the growth hypothesis of heterochrony suggests that using a linear model, the proportion of time between onset alpha and offset beta of growth determines this growth trajectory. So this is a simple linear model like we saw with the bivariate case. This goes back to Alberg. And this is these are the conditions for this linear model. You have an onset and offset. The onset is alpha, the offset is beta, and you just simply turn those on and off at different times. And so you have this happens in development, it's very linear, and we have a mathematical representation of it. So this is what it looks like. You have this alpha, this beta, you change alpha, you change beta. If you the offset of beta occurs much later than this interval, you get a slope k, which changes when comparing these two, the black function and the red function. So in this case, I've drawn out the k or the slope for these two red functions, and these two red functions are different, but the black and the red functions are also different. So the growth hypothesis would suggest that when the relative values of alpha and beta change, the slope k changes as well. And so this difference between k1 and k2 are equivalent to something called tau, which we'll talk about several slides down the line. So keep that in mind. But this is basically this change in slope is something greater than just something trivial. So the growth hypothesis also suggests, suggests that you can have more than one trajectory in the same organism or in the same developmental um, duration or the developmental um, duration for a single organism. So the growth hypothesis suggests that we can have two growth trajectories, Y1 and Y2, which are nominally independent. So they might be different genetic modules, or they might be different parts of life history. And these different uh, growth functions are nominally independent, but they can also be combined in different ways. And so in this case, we have alpha 1 and beta 1. So this is the first part of the growth trajectory. And then at some point in life, you switch to this red growth trajectory, which continues out a little farther. But this, in this case, we're just showing a continuous path from alpha 1 to beta 2. So this, this first group, this black growth trajectory, there's a switch here when it intersects with the red trajectory that flips it to this growth trajectory. If this growth trajectory were in a different organism, say this red function, it would behave like this. It would be almost sigmoidal in its expression. But since they're combined, there's a continuous uh, curve that includes this Whole, all of this uh, black growth trajectory in this part of the red growth trajectory. And so we can model these sort of hidden factors within growth in an organism. Uh, now, in some organisms, you have something called discontinuous development, which is where you have this black function, and then you have this gray dotted line, and then you have this red function. So this gray dotted line might represent something like metamorphosis, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, that sort of separate these two functions. And you have this function that grows, you know, there's growth and then the growth ends, and then something happens to the phenotype or transforms, and you need a new growth trajectory, and you pick up in a discontinuous fashion. So now that we talk, we're starting to talk about compound heterochrony, we can actually pose a compound hypothesis of heterochrony. So we can say that actually uh, growth and you know, growth and heterochrony are linear, but they can also be the combination of delay and sequence hypothesis. So we can combine the delay aspects of the bivariate case with some other uh, things that we'll talk about in a minute that combine for to have this sort of compound nature to development. And so we can see here where we have different developmental programs, which are represented by these different colored shapes, which can either overlap be continuous or not overlap and be discontinuous. And so the takeaway from this slide is that a continuous trajectory represented by something like this, where you have a linear function, can shift to something nonlinear. 
And so we can model these things. We don't have to necessarily model it from a real system. We can work theoretically and figure out what kinds of things are behind these sort of shifts from continuous to discontinuous. So this is an example of discontinuous development. And this is actually metamorphosis. This is the example of a caterpillar metamorphosing into a butterfly. And you see that the caterpillar forms this cocoon at some stage in development. There's decellularization that goes on and some other uh, differentiation of cells, de-differentiation and re-differentiation. And eventually you end up with this butterfly. So this is a close-up shot of the process where you have the caterpillar establishing a cocoon, changes in the cellularization of the organism, and then you end up with this butterfly. So this is an example here of this discontinuous uh, development. But what else can we learn from this example? And I mentioned before that sequences are also important. So there's this thing called sequence, the sequence hypothesis of heterochrony. And this is an actually a qualitative description of this process. But this is basically uh, the idea that development exists as a series of stages and that these stages represent a sequence. So you have sequence A through sequence C, or sequence A through sequence E, or stage A through stage E, and they form this sequence. So things happen at each stage, and then they combine to give you this uh, continuous function. Now, what happens though when you permutate these stages, so that C, D, and B are all permutated? Well, you end up with this nonlinear sequence of events you end up with things going on at the in, within each stage, but since the stages are permutated, you end up with a nonlinear growth function. This is the same growth function as this, it's just that you've taken these stages of development and you've mixed them around. So this is actually in, in, interesting when you think about this discontinuous development, because you think about these different growth trajectories and you think about how they combine and we can see that sequence the sequence hypothesis of heterochrony might actually explain some of this as well. But we also talked about delays earlier. We talked about it in terms of differences in slope and K, and then that's related to something called tau. So this is the delay hypothesis of heterochrony. So in this case, we're using something called delay differential equations. And these DDEs can be used to characterize both absolute changes and relative rates of change in growth. So we have these DDEs, which are characterized by time delay systems. And this is the form that they take. And then this represents the, the trajectory of solutions in the past, and then tries to figure out how those things are delayed and or can be delayed. And so we end up with, in both DDEs and time delay systems, we can solve them using what they call the method of steps. And so we, this is the formulation for a DDE with a single delay. We have this tau parameter, which is, of course, what we're going to use for our time delays in lieu of the change in k. And so then we can combine this with alpha and beta and come up with a model where we have an onset and offset, and then a delay in, in the onset and offset, or delays within that trajectory. And so we have this delay in the growth trajectory is characterized over this interval alpha beta and is equivalent to this change in k. Uh, the total length of the delayed process involves a tau measurement for both alpha and beta. And then we can characterize a little bit better as to what this delay represents. So a concrete example of developmental delay, as opposed to something like uh, metamorphosis or this discontinuity, is diapause in Drosophila. So Drosophila is a well-known model organism, and insects have this thing where if you raise their eggs at a certain temperature, it has phenotypic effects, both in development and adulthood. So you expose a, a Drosophila to different levels of light and heat, and this can affect ovarian maturation in, in the embryo. And so you have this embryo where it's raised at 25 C and then it's placed at 12 C. And this has an effect on diapause. And this also has an effect on chill survival. If you by contrast, raise the egg from 15 Celsius, and then you place it at 12 Celsius. This has a negative effect on diapause and a negative effect on chill survival. So fewer 
uh, Drosophila survive showing the negative 20 C when you have this treatment here. And so these are examples of developmental delay and how development unfolds to form a, an adult phenotype. And it's an example also of how we might model this mathematically. Um, but delays are important in heteroprotein and in development in general. Uh, another case here is where we're looking sort of at something we call a divergence measure. And so we might want to look at two different developmental trajectories, and we might want to look at the heteroprotein or change in growth between them. But we might want to do this in a continuous fashion. So we might want to assess these functions all the way from the origin point all the way down to the offset point. And so we can do that here with, and in this case, we have a partial delay. So we have a delay in this period phase of development, but not this phase. And so since this is a compound thing, we want to know the divergence across this entire function. And so we can do this with by looking at the rate of divergence between both curve trajectories using this measure here. And so this measure here is a divergence measure that we can use and, and characterize this over developmental time. At any point in developmental time, we should be able to detect where the delays begin and end, and where the, the trajectories are isomorphic with respect to time and growth. We can also model compound trajectories where they bifurcate at some point. So here we have alpha 1, and we end this growth trajectory for both of these cases is, um, is the same up to alpha 2. And then at alpha 2, there's a bifurcation point, so that there are two offset points, each with different rates of growth. And so we have two intersecting developmental programs that tend to bifurcate here, but they have this identical uh, developmental trajectory back in this part of the trajectory, in the black part of the trajectory. And so in this case, we can observe these alternate growth trajectories, and we can link them to a common history, but we can use our notations and our parameters to measure each aspect of this bifurcating trajectory. Then we can introduce other kinds of tools. So I've been talking about mathematical characterizations of the growth trajectory up to now. Now I want to talk about something called triangular state machines. And these are uh, graphs or trees. Actually, they're not um, directed trees. They're semi-directed trees because you have things that go in both directions in some of these trees. But they provide a mechanism for modeling gene-gene interactions and that they facilitate pattern formation. So this is a binary gene expression network. It starts at this root and it either acts in trans or acts in cis. And it acts in trans by triggering another type of regulatory element. And it acts in cis by operating at its same level of uh, the same type of regulatory element. And so this is the way this works. And then you have these identities for the nodes. And there are things that go up and down the nodes and they're exchanging information. And one of these triangular state machines, they generally exist at the bottom of the tree towards the tips. And there are these triangular relationships where you have things going from one to 10, 10 to 11, and 11 to one. And you have these triangular relationships, these, these uh, circuits or these loops in the tree that then facilitate pattern formation through interactions between nodes at the same level. And so we can do this and generate all sorts of different patterns and we can control the rate of information th flow through these networks uh, using our original parameters. We can also overlap these trees so that, you know, this is an example of two developmental programs that are overlapping so that they can refine the spatial scale of pattern formation at the tips of these trees. So each of these trees, they generate things that go down to the tips, and then there's something that's emitted from the tips in terms of a phenotype. And so if we look at this, it used, just using a simple binary tree, we can see th how this works. And so this is something called a Galton board, which is, uh, if you've ever seen the game Plinko, um, and you can look this up on Google, you'll know what this is immediately. But you have something that's emitted from the root of the tree, and it goes down to each of these nodes. And in each node, the node can either, and this is a probabilistic decision by the node, 
it can either sort the emission in this direction or pass it down to the next node. And so if it sorts it in this direction, it accumulates down at the tip of the tree here. If it passes down to this node, then this node decides whether it is going to emit or it's going to pass on to this node and so forth. And so when, as these emissions work through the binary tree, they accumulate at the bottom. And this is sort of um, analogous to an anatomical axis, like an uh, anterior or posterior axis, where you have different degrees of different uh, levels of accumulation of things. And you can see that it's it's not even, it's it's uneven and it's asymmetrical. And that's because each of these nodes are controlled by our three parameters, alpha, beta, and tau. And of course, there's an onset and offset and a delay to all these nodes in terms of what they're passing down, what they're emitting, and what they're passing to the next node. And so through that mechanism, we can see differential growth across this axis of things that are emitted out of the street. And so this is a good characterization of a one-dimensional phenotype. But we can also uh, use a two-dimensional spherical phenotype to get a little even, be uh, even better understanding of how these parameters map to actual uh, growth and form in, in different phenotypes. And so uh, this is a spherical embryo or a model of a spherical embryo. We're using one of these gene regulatory networks with uh, cycles in them and at these triangular state machines at the ends of the tree. And we're visualizing this as something called an expression tree. So it starts from the center of the tree and it emits or it, it radiates outward and it forms these tissues at different layers. And these tissues are uh, the centroid of each of these tissues are one of these nodes, and these tissues grow at different rates. And they, uh, and so these are the four parameters that control a lot of what's going on in this model. And so we have like an angle of differentiation. So how far apart are these tissues from its mother tissue? How far apart are the daughter tissues in this arc? Uh, the depth of the tree. So the depth of the tree can be set so we can have this tree is level four has four levels. It's asymmetrical because the fourth level exists on this side only. Uh, we have C, which is acting in cis, which is uh, basically the uh, interactions between uh, tissues at the same level. And then this blob volume, which is this any one of these little circles is a blob. And these blobs change their size based on our original parameters, alpha, beta, and tau. Um, they can grow in shape, they can grow in size, and they can delay their growth relative to time so that if you see in this third level, you have this difference in, in size across these different uh, spheres. And this one's very small. So this one, growth was delayed quite a bit. Or alternately, the onset of alpha was uh, delayed quite a bit. And so we can use all those parameters to model these kinds of, kinds of structures. Uh, also, you see that in this case, in the second level, you have a lot of um, asymmetry or eccentricity of this, of this oval. And so that's also something that results from these parameters being set at different levels. Finally, we have something called Lagrangian growth and form. This is something that uh, Richard Gordon from the Devil Worm Group came up with uh, this is thinking about embryos as Lagrangian structures. And so we go back to our trajectory divergence measures and convergence, I guess. Uh, we use that measurement and we can use other parameters to understand the embryo as sort of a Lagrangian system where we have these spatial flows. So now we're going from this bivariate space of linear functions to a spatial flow. And so this is something we can use to look at the divergence of so many edges in space calcium waves in embryos or other differential spatial phenomena as a function of time. So here we have things that are flowing outward and things that are flowing inward in a sphere, in a spherical volume. And these are things we can measure using this Lagrangian approach. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to measure different aspects of changes in growth. So finally, I invite you to check out our preprint here, Developmental Incongruity as a Dynamical Representation of Heterochrony. So I've talked about the last part of this, but the developmental incongruity part is something that is uh, a sort of a case study for 
what we're looking at here, kind of rooted in this idea of developmental incongruity or development where you have multiple competing uh, developmental programs or uh, discontinuous growth and development, things like that. And so that's what we focus on in this preprint. It's on BioArchive. Also check out our Representational Brains and Phenotypes group. It's a group of people interested in development and growth and form, and then also cognition and modeling, um, all these things. So it's a very eclectic group, but we're interested in this issue with, along with other issues. I haven't mentioned it here, but we also have a group called the Devo Worm Group that is also interested in more of the developmental biology aspect of this only and mapping that to data. And so uh, check that out. And here are the references. Again, like I said, the idea of heterochrony goes back quite a ways, but these references start in 1979. Uh, we, you know, there are references uh, on sequence heterochrony on time delay systems, which is purely a mathematical concept that we've applied to this work. The Elberg paper, which kind of lays out the idea of heterochrony as a uh, quantitative model. And then finally, Don Williamson, who did a lot of uh, you know, sort of original thinking on larvae and how development and evolution interface and how, you know, we have different types of developmental programs potentially within the same organism and that sort of mosaicism. Um, and so, I mean, not some of his things were probably misguided, but it's a good thing to read through if you want to get a good sense of, you know, he's a very good anatomist, so you get a good sense of what's going on in development. So thank you for your attention and hope you enjoyed the talk.